Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about how languages express unreality. But first, thank you to everyone who celebrated our anniversary month with us. We always enjoy seeing what you recommend to people and thanking you for doing that. If you did that not on social media, in your own private media channels, thank you very much. And you can share enthusiasm with anyone who needs more linguistics in their life throughout the year. Our most recent bonus episode is a conversation about swearing in science fiction and fantasy with Ada Palmer and Joe Walton. I was so excited to hear you talk to two of our favorite authors. We've talked about Ada Palmer's Two Like the Lightning and the Terra Ignota series before, and we've talked about Joe Walton's Thessaly books. So getting to hear you talk to them about swearing in fantasy and in science fiction was a whole lot of fun. This was so much fun. We also have several other bonus episodes about swearing more generally, as well as a massive archive of bonus episodes. If you're looking for something to do and you wish there were more enthusiasm episodes, or you just want to help us keep making the show, those are there. You can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to get access to our full archive of bonus episodes for yourself, or they make a great last minute gift idea. Gretchen, what is real? That's a big philosophical question, Lauren. What does it mean for something to be real? Mm -hmm. But we could also answer it linguistically. (laughs) We could indeed. So languages have lots of ways of talking about things that aren't real. And sometimes this itself can get tricky. So if you want to start a fun discussion among your friends (laughs) uh, at the dinner table, try asking them things like, is a toy sword a real sword? Hmm. I can totally see a context where you're playing with toy swords or maybe those big foam swords that people use in live action role playing. Mm -hmm. In that context, it's a real sword. You're like, please don't hit me with your sword or I'm going to practice my sword work. And it is more of a real sword than a mimed sword or an entirely imaginary sword. Mm -hmm. Like it is real as in you can touch it, but it is not real as in it could cut people. True. So one of my friends has a cheese plate that comes with these delightful small like swords and daggers and axes that you could use to (laughs) cut cheese with. (laughs) Cute. Uh, Which is great. And this is, by some definitions, a real sword because you can cut things with it even if those things are cheese. Hmm. Probably taken away from you as a weapon if you tried to take it on an aeroplane. (laughs) This is, you know, are we letting the airplane security people decide what a real sword is? (laughs) Um, the solution to all of our philosophical questions is just answered by airline security people. I'm taking a really weird range of stuff to the airport next time I travel just to check <laughs> what is real. But then there are things that exist, but not in this reality. So Excalibur is a famous sword, but is it a real sword? Right. And you could probably, there's a museum somewhere that has something that claims mm-hmm. that it's Excalibur. It certainly is a sword that has a bunch of cultural connotations with it that has a level of reality that's different than a magical sword that someone just makes up as a fantasy novel writer for their own novel that doesn't have a broader cultural existence. I feel in some ways it's more real than a foam sword or a cheese plate Hmm. sword because it is more prototypically sword-like in my head. Could you imagine if Arthur went around with a cheese plate size (laughs) sword or a a foam (laughs) sword? That's that's the version of King (laughs) Arthur I'm going to (laughs) rewrite. Well, I recently saw a production of Macbeth Mm -hmm. in which – so Macbeth has this famous speech which starts, is this a dagger that I see before me? And he's not sure if he's hallucinating or not. You know, he's about to kill the king and he's feeling guilty about it. He's not sure if it's just a cheese board. (laughs) Is is it just a cheese dagger? Uh, But in this production, which was also interesting because all of the characters were dressed up as goblins, but that's that's a whole other thing. Um, (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) We'll we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. Sure. Um, The – Staging represented the dagger at first as a beam of light, like a sort of tightly focused spotlight in front of Macbeth, Mm -hmm. and everything else on the stage was all in red, and there was this beam of white light. And so you're saying, is this a dagger that I see before me? And you're seeing this beam of light. So in that context, the audience is supposed to be believing that Macbeth is hallucinating. And then the Mm -hmm. actor pulls out like a prop dagger that I'm sure was probably not very sharp um, to subsequently be the murder weapon that he's going to go kill the king with. Uh And so... Is this a real dagger? Is this an unreal dagger? And different productions approach this question of is Macbeth seeing something real or not Mm -hmm. 
in different ways. So the prop dagger is more of a real dagger than the beam of light dagger. And in the play, it stands in as a real dagger, but it's less of a real dagger than a sharp one that might stab someone. Right. I'm keeping track. Exactly. <laughs> and they w- just to be clear, were they real goblins? Well, <laughs> I certainly felt like I had just seen, you know, some goblins perform Macbeth. Mm-hmm. And I had to keep sort of reminding myself, like, no, they've just got costumes on. Because, man, those costumes were really great. So the actors came out into the like the lobby and interacted mm-hmm. with the audience before and after the show. So they as felt goblins in as character? goblins in character. Okay. Sort of improvising. So they right. felt like they were real goblins. <laughs> yeah. And then I've had to explain this show to other people and they've been like, so wait, were they humans in the play? And I was like, no, it's it's complicated. It all made sense at the time though, I promise. <laughs> Amazing. I do have a moment of like caution because goblins aren't real in our world. But also, goblins have been used by a bunch of 20th century fantasy writers to stand in for, uh, for example, Jewish people in not always the, like, most sensitive or appropriate way. Is that something that was happening here, I say, with caution? (laughs) No, thank goodness. Okay. Um, No. So, one of the things you can do with something that has a you know, sort of cultural reality is the characters are very careful to say like, you know, these other writers, you may have heard other things about goblins, they were all wrong, we're the real goblins, and we're going to tell you like the real story of goblins, which is not at all anti-Semitic in the context of the actors wanting to do this play. Okay, so they were more real fake goblins than the fake, fake goblins of fantasy. Exactly. Like they were laying claim to being the real goblins and being like, no, these other authors have said nasty things about this, but that's not who we are. Hilarious. (laughs) Hilarious. <laughs> Which is something that you can do with something that has a cultural level of, of reality. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I had a dog is a hypothetical statement, but dogs are real. Yep, you could have a pet dog <laughs> if you wanted to. <laughs> and if I had a dragon is also a hypothetical statement, <laughs> but it has a different level of hypothetical reality. You could put a little costume on a lizard, but yeah, you're not getting a pet dragon of fire-breathing winged fantasy fame. (laughs) Well, but like maybe I have a dragon plush toy, which is a real (laughs) dragon that I could have. True. Much easier to feed than a real dog (laughs) or lizard. My house insurance is a much bigger fan of me having a, you know, stuffed dragon. (laughs) Those have a different level of reality compared to if I say, if I have a Frenumbligger. Uh, if you have a what what? Well, a Frenumbligger, clearly, which is the creature that makes it not rain when you bring an umbrella. Ah, oh, I absolutely always take an umbrella everywhere with me, but I didn't realize I was appeasing this particular deity. <laughs> well, if only you'd realized you were appeasing the Frenumbligger, which is a creature that we made up that doesn't have a cultural reality beyond this podcast. So dragons are more real than Frenumblingers, even though both of them are not real. Yeah. And so reality itself is sort of a continuum and depends on the context that you're talking about. It's so great that language lets us talk about things that aren't here and aren't real. And that may or may not be real in the future. And a lot of the time we do this with words, like something being not real, or there might be dragons. Or fake or toy or things like that. Imaginary. But languages can also use grammatical marking as part of a way of showing whether something's real or not in the way that we do our grammar. And this is referred to with a delightful name, which is the irrealis. So there are various kinds of irrealis markers that happen Mm -hmm. at a grammatical level, in addition to all of the ways you can use words to talk about things that are imaginary or pretend or fake or constructed. And there's lots of different ways that we talk about the slipperiness of reality in language. And we're going to talk about the grammatical structures of irrealis for the rest of this episode. So we've talked about stories and sort of deliberately imaginary or fantastical context. But there's also lots of places in everyday language Mm -hmm. where we want to talk about things that haven't happened and may never happen, but might happen. We want to talk about them. (laughs) For example, if it rains, I bring an umbrella, regardless of whether I believe in front and blingo. (laughs) Um, And, you know, that's a relatively here and now, if then statement. We can also say, if it rains, I will cancel the picnic, which is something that's even more hypothetical. Disappointing, but fair enough if we have to do that. And then you can have more hypothetical conditional statements, like if all the raindrops were lemon drops and gumdrops, oh, what a rain that would be. Um, That sounds horrifying. 
<laughs> Wait, do you not know this children's song? I do not know this children's song. It sounds like the start of an apocalypse. <laughs> if it had rained lemon drops and gumdrops, the plants would have been crushed under the and weight. Not to mention us. I don't think my umbrella is going to be much help here. <laughs> not to mention the effects on the water table. Oh, gosh. This is a absolute ecological apocalypse here. How terrifying. <laughs> Conditionals can be used to talk about both relatively realistic uh, hypothetical events and also very fantastical ones. I'm going to go listen to this song after this, but I am already scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be even more excited to learn that the second verse goes, if all the snowflakes were candy bars and milkshakes. <laughs> How are we even going to produce that many candy bars and that much milkshake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a snow that would be. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> My favorite type of conditionals are not candy mm -hmm. bars and milkshakes. They are, in fact, biscuit conditionals. Oh, delightful. <laughs> Going from one food to the next. So mm -hmm. this is a famous example from J.L. Austin, who has the statement, there are biscuits on the sideboard if you want them. Oh, thanks. But where are the biscuits if I don't want them? <laughs> And this is the thing, because in these examples of, like, if it rains, I bring an umbrella. If it doesn't rain, maybe I don't bring an umbrella, or maybe I bring one just in case to appease Frenumblinger. Compared to, there are biscuits on the sideboard if you want them, and if you don't want them, well, where are they? <laughs> there are lots of different relationships between the first half and the second half of a conditional, and I do like that biscuit conditionals set you up for a really great mom joke there. Yeah, there's a related XKCD comic which goes, I'll be in your city tomorrow if you want to hang out. But where will you be if I don't want to hang out? <laughs> uh, I do actually want to hang out. <laughs> I want to hang out too. But yeah, this sort of like what happens with the other half of the if. And this is one of the tricky things with talking about hypothetical events, that there are lots of different ways of getting into that hypothetical. Which is why the caption on the XKCD comic is why I try not to be pedantic about conditionals. <laughs> Very important. A good motto to live by. <laughs> a lot of conditionals are slippery when the hypothetical part is in the future, and that's because future is quite difficult. It is unknowable. <laughs> by its very nature, because we have a linear progression of time. And that means that the future and Irrealis bump up against each other in really interesting ways. Right. So if you make a statement, relatively unremarkable, future-y statement, like I'm probably going to go to the store tomorrow, mm -hmm. or I want to bake a cake tonight, mm -hmm. these are fine. These express sort of a future or a desired future. But if you make the past equivalent, so instead of I'm probably going to the store tomorrow, I probably went to the store yesterday? Uh, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> like, was I sleepwalking? Like, was I consuming a substance that made me forget things? Like, that's Do suddenly you have amnesia? Much weirder statement. Yeah. And I want to bake a cake tonight. Fine. I wanted to bake a cake last night is fine, but it implies that it didn't actually happen. Yeah. Like, I wanted to bake a cake last night. In fact, I did bake one. Okay, but why don't you just say I baked a cake last night? For sure. In fact, this is where English will for future came from. Something like, I will bake a cake, originally meant something much more like, I want to bake a cake. You still get, I think, sometimes these sort of older, tiny things like, I know it's going to happen, I will it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same will in origin. It, the wanting intensely is that sort of future will, it became that future will. And the way that will is turning into something much more grammatical in the English future is a nice example of how different languages will sometimes use words and sometimes use grammar for these less real irrealis contexts. Right. And so like English still has a grammatical past. I baked a cake last night, which is mm -hmm. different from I, I bake a cake right now. But in some languages, instead of having sort of a past non-past, like we have in English, what you actually have is a realis irrealis, mm -hmm. where you have one form of a verb to talk about things that have happened or that are currently happening, any version of it that's real. And then you have another form that's talking about any version of it that's unreal, whether that's future or hypothetical or that whole class of things. And it also makes sense as a way of sort of splitting the conceptual time frame into things that I have evidence for actually happening and things that I don't yet have evidence for. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Manam, which is an Austronesian language in Papua New Guinea, doesn't have a tense distinction like past and present and future. It has a realis and an irrealis form. 
and they're all prefixes on the verb. Right. So there's one set of prefixes for realis, whether it's like, I'm doing this, you're doing that, we're doing this, they're doing this, and so on. And there's one for irrealis, which is like, I might, or I will, or we might, or they might, or all of these groups of forms. Mm -hmm. Another example of a language that uses realis versus irrealis as a really important distinction is terena, which is a southern Arawak language spoken in southwestern Mato Grosso, Brazil. And they have two different forms for every verb, which is actual or potential, basically realis and irrealis, mm -hmm. that have different suffixes. So you have things that are realis, which can be translated as stuff like he went or when he went or he will go, which in this case is grouped with the realis. And then you it's have definitely going to happen. The idea that it's definitely going to happen, and then in the irrealis category, you have things more like "let him go" or "when he goes," which is more hypothetical. Hmm. So, what people segment up as realis and irrealis differs depending on the grammar of a language. Exactly, and in many cases, English uses just like extra words like "will" or "want" or "let" or "if" to indicate that something is irrealis. But we do have. Mm -hmm a few verb forms that are also used for hypothetical events. And one of my favourites involves both mid-20th century musicals and Gwen Stefani. Great. And so in English, we have two different structures. We have if I were a rich man, mm -hmm. and that is a slightly different structure to if I was a rich girl. Ah, so these are two relatively famous songs. Uh, if I were a rich mm -hmm. man comes from Fiddler on the Roof, which is a 1964 musical. And If I Were a Rich Girl is a Gwen Stefani song from 2004. So this conveniently gives us these sort of great dates for when these two forms were more popular, If I Were, If I Was, and then these two songs that are kind of influenced by each other. And this form that has were, instead of just the normal past tense was, uh, is something known as the subjunctive. Ah, the, the elusive subjunctive in English. And it is elusive because it is changing into this regular past tense form, as we see with Gwen Stefani's If I Was a Rich Girl. Right. So not everybody says the subjunctive in that context. It's still optionally there. And, you know, you have to do it in if I were or if he were, because in all the other forms, if you were, if they were, if we were, it's just the same as the past tense form. So you have to use it with I or he or she, one of the forms that would use was in another context to be able to see it show up, which is probably why it's kind of fragile and disappearing. Yeah, I think so. So can we try to do a little bit of, of antedating? So Fiddler on the Roof comes out in 1964, but the title of the song, If I Were a Rich Man, um, having now looked into it, was inspired by a monologue from 1902 by Sholem Aleichem, which was in Yiddish. And the title of that was Venik bin Rothschild, or literally, If I Were a Rothschild. So I don't have to speak Yiddish to know that they're talking about the very rich American Rothschild family. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and something that I think is interesting grammatically about the title of this monologue, which is a great monologue because it all goes out about how he's going to like build schools for all the, you know, poor children and stuff. It's, it's a great monologue. Um, <laughs> but cool. is ich bin, which is the same as the German form ich bin, like I am. Mm -hmm. Whereas the German subjunctive form in this context is ich wäre, right. which is more like I were. So Yiddish and German are related, but they're already doing different things. They're already doing th different things specifically with subjunctive. And mm -hmm. Yiddish is already following this trajectory that English is following, where it's getting closer to the more usual form for I am. Hmm. And you're just meant to know that it's hypothetical because he's not a Rothschild and he's not building schools. Well, and you have this word if, yeah. I also did some antedating on Gwen Stefani's version of If mm -hmm. I Was a Rich Girl, which was on her debut solo album, Love Angel Music Baby. And it turns out that it's actually a cover of a 1993 song by Luchi Lu and Michi Wan, where they also sing If I Was a Rich Girl. So already by the early 90s in younger people's speech, you see the subjunctive slipping. And who are Luchi Lu and Michi Wan? They're a British female raga soul duo from London in the early 90s, and we'll link to the film clip for this track because they're clearly having a lot of fun with it. And so they may have sort of had their finger on the pulse of language change a bit sooner than Gwen Stefani in 2004. 
Yeah. When I think about the connection between if I were a rich man and if I was a rich girl, I think of uh, an acapella mashup from the mid 2010s, uh, which right. combines these two songs. Amazing. <laughs> in a very fun music video from some very posh looking British acapella singers, which we can also link to because it sort of reinforces that I hadn't really realized that if I was a rich girl is actually playing on if I were a rich man. And they're using some of the same beats in the background as songs. I hadn't realized there was a connection between those. But I should say, when when Gwen Stefani came out with that song, she'd already released some music and she was already pretty wealthy. And so at the time, uh, yes. <laughs> you got some, you know, newspaper commenters and so on, who were saying, like, is it a bit disingenuous for you to be saying if I was a rich girl, because you are, in fact, a rich girl. Yeah, but the lyric, if I were not the rich girl that I am, so I can be an avatar for my unwealthy audience, doesn't really have the same rhythm to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gwen Stefani at the time explained that as she was talking about the time before she had found commercial success when she used mm. to be broke, which maybe, right. you know, okay. <laughs> A different level of hypothetical there. <laughs> yeah, two levels of hypotheticality. Yeah. So we're seeing this really interesting development over the last century or so in English where the subjunctive is changing in English. And sometimes people say that this is losing the subjunctive. But interestingly, in both cases, it's a past form. If I was and if I were are both using the form that is associated with the past, was or were, to refer to an event that is very much not in the past. In fact, it hasn't happened. <sighs> this is why it's so hard to learn it as a second language speaker. <laughs> Right. The subjunctive is something that often comes up when people are learning languages like French, Spanish, Italian. In German, it's called the conjunctive, but it's, you know, the same thing, the conjunctive and the, and the conditional. Because these languages have more fully fledged forms for the subjunctive that they use to express a range of meanings that English speakers know how to express, but aren't used to thinking as all of the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it must actually be really hard if someone speaks one of those languages first and is coming in and trying to learn English. And they're like, what do you mean? I just had this one easy form that I use for all this stuff and I have to learn like seven different ways of expressing it now. <laughs> for sure. Like, I think this must actually also be hard because English doesn't have one unified subjunctive. We have a whole range of extra stuff and you can just use the subjunctive for all of them. That's so easy. Yeah. I mean, you can be like me, and whenever anyone talks about the subjunctive, in my head, I just hear, if I was slash were a rich man slash girl. I'm glad that you're that you're covering the full range of possible forms there with was and were. Yeah, I remember feeling confused about this form in the classroom, trying to use a subjunctive where a lot of the times the context that you're talking about things are very sort of remote and seem kind of artificial. And the thing that really made me feel more comfortable using the subjunctive and recognizing it was just encountering it in the wild in a bunch of contexts where it was like, oh, yeah, this is sort of what this has to mean. So there's a particularly useful song for the French subjunctive, if you like, which is on a classic Celine Dion album from the 1990s. Excellent. So the song is called Pour que tu m'aimes encore, which is the title, which translates that sort of like, so that you love me again. Okay. And the you love is subjunctive and it's hypothetical. You know, it's it's not the case, otherwise you wouldn't have a song to write, yeah. but it's saying all the things that the speaker would do so that the other person loves them again. Really looking forward to the Celine Dion Gwen Stefani mashup that really <laughs> helps people learn the French and English subjunctive forms. Sounds great. <laughs> the subjunctive is one of a set of different ways that we can talk about whether things are real or not. There are also a subset of irrealist categories that are about trying to make the reality that you want to happen. And uh, there's a great list on Wikipedia to check out. I feel like this was written by a linguist who is like me and remembers that there are different types of irrealist categories, but never remembers their formal names. This is definitely one of those cases when it's like, if you know Latin, you just name everything with Latin roots, and then it sounds fancier mm. than like the wish subjunctive and the <laughs> want to make people do things subjunctive. Yes. So we are going to use the fancy names here, but like me, you're absolutely not obliged to remember them. You can just click on the Wikipedia link whenever you want to think about Every single them time. Yeah. <laughs> so let's both pick our favorite two of these categories. But Lauren, we're both going to pick the hortative because it's so cool. 
It is, and I just used it with let's. <laughs> you just used it. So let's both pick our favorite two subjunctive forms. The hortative is something that exhorts, it urges. Mm -hmm. It's often found with let in English, something like let us love each other, let it snow, let there be light imploring, insisting, or encouraging by the speaker. Sometimes a language will have a specific form potentially used for the hortative, or this will be one of the categories that something like a subjunctive or another irrealis form can be used for. What's one of your favorites if you can't have the hortative? <laughs> well, if I can't have the hortative, I will go for the category where an event is hoped for, expected, or awaited, which is the Ooh, optative. The optative. I want to opt in to this coming event. Do you have an example <laughs> of the optative? Uh, something like, may I be loved, or... Oh. May they get what they deserve, <laughs> which sounds threatening or hopeful, depending on the context. <laughs> Can you use something like a if only? So in Russian, to do something like the optative, uh, it would be uh, literally translated as something like if only, if only she came back mm. to do that kind of expected or hoped for thing. So we have a sort of may something happen if only something happened. Maybe I wish something had happened. Yeah, I love Abkhaz, which is the language that Sarah Dopiarella works on. We interviewed her for a bonus. I love that it has two different optative forms, Ooh. and they both do slightly different things. So in Abkhaz, you have optative one, which is to curse and to bless, and then optative two is to express a wish, a dream, or a desire. So the first one would be something like the form of greetings is literally, may you see something good? Which is a kind That's of a lovely blessing. greeting. Yes. It's a lovely great. I quite like it. And uh, optative two would be something like, I wish she'd drink the water. Mm. So you get these two different forms that give you kind of an idea of the different ways you can do an optative. I mean, I guess technically, like we did a whole episode about the imperative. So mm -hmm. that's things like drink the water and see something good and come back. And that is technically a type of irrealis, because if you're commanding someone to do something, it hasn't happened yet. Oh, well, yeah. So now you can go back and listen to the whole imperative episode as an irrealis episode. In principle, we could have done an entire hortative episode and an entire optative episode, but we, you know, decided to think about the macro category for a while first. My final category is one for when you're not necessarily sure about the thing that you're talking about. So you can't be entirely certain if it's real or not. Ooh. And uh, this feature shows up in Yolmo. So I wrote about it for my thesis and I wrote about it for a whole year before saying it. And it turns <laughs> out that I hate to say the word dubitative, 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 dubitative. Dubitative. Indubitative. I'm very happy to write it for a year. And then I gave a presentation and I was just like, oh, this is a problem. But it is a grammatical category in Yolmo. And I do have to talk about it because it's one that crops up in a whole bunch of languages. In English, we use a word like might, you know, I might make a cake. He maybe made a cake. Uh, so we use lots of different words for showing a lack of certainty. In other languages, it's part of the grammar. So in Ojibwe, which is an Algonquian language in North America, there is a specific suffix. So the difference between saying something like akozi, meaning he's sick, or akozi dog, which is something like he must be sick. I guess he's sick. Maybe he's sick. Like, I can't see inside this person's head. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I can't say for certain whether they're sick, but they look pretty miserable. Um yeah, I find having a grammatical form for whether you're certain about something is so handy. Technically, if you like, I did look up how to say this word and Oxford says dubitative. Mm -hmm. But you know, language is pluricentric. You can say it however you like. I've definitely heard all of those different pronunciations <laughs> from different people over time. And I guess I will just continue to be uncertain about the way it's pronounced. Would you say you have doubt? Uh, would you say you're dubitative or dubitative about how to say dubitative? <laughs> I would definitely use a dubitative grammatical form about my certainty about pronouncing it if we had one in English. <laughs> Excellent. I think my final form that I'm excited about, because I, I'm not counting imperative, because we did a whole episode about that. Um, and I want to talk about a form that you can use to express a desire or a wish of the participant. Hmm. So if you want to say something like, I wish she loved me, you have desire, you can use a desiderative 
I think mm-hmm. that's the only way it's said. <laughs> and there are languages from Japanese and Mongolian to Sanskrit and Proto-Indo-European that all have deserative forms of some sort. Oh, yeah. I like when a nice form crops up across a bunch of languages. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that desire to try to impose order or predict what people are going to say or what's going to be reality is part of what makes irrealis forms like the subjunctive complicated and confusing for people to learn is that they're trying to talk about this whole class of events that haven't happened yet and may or may not ever happen, Mm -hmm. which itself is confusing and chaotic to try to predict the future. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's not the grammar's fault that we're using it to speculate about the unknowable. For sure. (laughs) But one thing that we do know is that there is a fun etymology related to trying to impose order and predict the future of what people are going to be like. Oh, I love a fun etymology story. Have you ever wondered why the Greek zodiac and the Chinese zodiac are both called zodiacs, even though one is months and the other one is years? Um, I have never thought about this before. And is it something to do with the fact that, I mean, they both have cycles of 12 animals. So they definitely have a lot in common, even though they don't work on the same 12 rotation cycle. Well, interestingly, it has nothing to do with 12, Mm. but etymologically, um, they come from the Greek zodiacos cyclos, or zodiac circle, which is literally a circle of little animals. Oh, zo as in like zoo. Yeah. (laughs) But like diac just is a diminutive like little. Yeah. Oh, that is very cute. It's little animals. (laughs) (laughs) How adorable. And there are lots of tools that people use to make sense of the uncertainty or unknowability of reality in the future. Some of those tools are grammatical tools. Some of those tools are cute little animals, circles of little animals. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes that tool is etymology because people also use the origins of words to try to make sense of uncertainty, even though etymology is also not destiny. We believe that so strongly that we made it into a sticker. (laughs) <laughs> when you're thinking about what's real and what's not real, when you're wondering what's knowable or unknowable, what's certain or uncertain, the Aurealis is a form that connects you through time and space to generations of other people who have also wondered what's real. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all of the podcast platforms or go to lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts, and you can follow at lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including IPA, branching tree diagrams, booba and kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our new Etymology Isn't Destiny t-shirts and stickers at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen McSee on Blue Sky. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk to other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus episodes include my excursion to Linguistics Summer Camp, aka the LSA Linguistics Institute, a linguistics advice Q&A episode, and swearing in science fiction and fantasy. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens, and our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!